It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, Had an interesting kind of back and forth today. Uh, The idea of cancel culture. Hear this a lot from the folks on the right. Uh, The people who do horrible things and then when they're held accountable, uh, get a little angry about it. Uh, But here's the thing. There are some people who do dumb things and and want, want redemption. They made a mistake. Uh, should they be permanently barred from humanity? Uh, and this is something that, that people have been, been dealing with. And so I've been asked in a couple of different arenas how, how I deal with this idea of cancel culture and the inability of some to acknowledge that people make mistakes. People make mistakes and that forgiveness, forgiveness, something we should we should be pushing for. Uh, now, a friend pointed out that, you know, we live in this social media era, uh, this social media culture that never forgets. Uh, you put something out on the web, it doesn't go away. It is there for eternity because someone's always screenshotting. I'm amazed. Sometimes people will throw something up and go, you remember when you said this? And I go, maybe because <laughs> there's so much out there. Uh, but they've screenshot it to save for all of eternity. So that down the road they can go, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, and we live in this so-called you know, cancel culture era, which means that we, we're not allowed to forgive either. So it seems, as, as this friend pointed out, that we seem stuck in this impossible and painful trap where if you make a mistake, there is no forgiveness. Now, I've always said, you know, having grown up uh, in, in the Catholic Church, there was always... You know, you there was always the idea of of forgiveness. You know, you you had absolution. Uh, you went, you confessed, said you were sorry. You did your acts of contrition. Uh, you said your hail marys. You did all that stuff, and you truly were sorry, and you were, were forgiven. You know, this idea that um, you know you could clear your conscience and and not just for that the past transgressions, but going forward, don't do it again. Seems sane, seems rational, seems like something we could possibly want. So in my world, I'm that's where my mind is. I, I understand people make mistakes. Um, it's what you do going forward, you know, and how we how we deal with this. The sad reality is that we live in this time right now, where the loudest voices dominate our discourse. Uh, the people who can amplify the hatred and and the division, those are the people who get the most attention. Uh, we've allowed the, those folks, who, for whatever reason, their their personal fame, uh, their their ego, money, and money a big part of this, to have this kind of you know we remember you, and and this gotcha kind of stuff, and we haven't I don't think done a good enough job of pushing back and how we break this cycle. Uh, look, there are some truly horrible people who say horrible things. They should be held accountable, absolutely, without question. But as this this friend pointed out, you know, there was a, a kid who uh, was a 16 year old singer during a competition, and got canceled from this competition because when he was 12, he sat next to somebody who had something that looked like a clan hood on. Did the kid do it? I I, I don't believe that he was part of it. I don't know, but it it got that that steamroller going of. Uh, how do you how do you how do you fix this? Now, personally, I don't get into that. I don't get into the cancel culture stuff. Uh, it's not it's not my lane. Uh, I don't I don't get involved in the divisions. I'm somebody who goes. How do we how do we pull people together? How do we unite to get things done? Uh, look, there are people. There are tons of people out there who want to divide us on. And I say it all the time. You know, it's a uh, you know on white, black, you know, Hispanic. Uh, on you know, male, female, on you know, blue collar, white collar, green collar, ring around the collar. However, they can slice us and dice us and pit us against one another. That's the goal. Uh, the old Jay Gould quote: "I can pay half the working class to murder the other half." 
problem is, is that what the billionaires have figured out is as long as they can they can play to our fears and our divisions, they don't even have to pay us. Uh, we'll simply eat each other at every opportunity. And and what does that mean? Well, that means they get to walk away scot free. They get to steal from us constantly. They get to rob us blind while creating the kind of dissension uh, that they're masterful at. And you know, look, pick the issue. You know, pick the issue. I mean, because the wealthy, like I said, are really good at dividing us on artificial lines. Uh, you know, you're gay, straight. <laughs> you fight each other. Don't mind us robbing you blind. Black, white, male, female. Go down the list. These artificial lines that are created, and we do it to ourselves a lot of times. I've often said if we were just one giant, you know, you know, cocoa brown race of people who had the same color hair, the same color eyes, uh, the, you know, the same height, the same weight, we'd find reasons to, to disagree and to hate each other. And the wealth class would figure out how to exploit those lines. So again, they could rob us blind. So for me, it's never been, and this is this goes back as far as, as I can remember, and all of the 16 years I've been doing this show. Uh, I don't talk about things in terms of, of male or female or, or, or gender or gender or, or race or any of that stuff. I talk about things in, in economic terms. How do we make people's lives better? Uh, it's not about, because look, my lane is not the LGBTQ plus community. Not my lane. My lane is not uh, the, the Black Lives Matter lane. Not my lane. There are people who do that. Uh, it's not me. Uh, pick the divisive issue. I like to believe I'm I'm somewhere near the right side of history. I'm near the right side of, of the issue. I want everybody to have life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But for me, it all comes back down to the economics. And this is where, you know, I, I go back to the day after the, the 2020 election. Uh, the day after the 2020 election, while everyone was looking at Pennsylvania going, how is it that Donald Trump 660,000 votes ahead? Uh, well, because we haven't counted the other, the Democrats absentee ballots yet. While that was going on and all the division and all of the, the, the stuff was going on, I was leading a strike of 55 workers, you know, somewhere a little bit, but south of where I live here in central Pennsylvania. And now these 55 workers were kind of a microcosm of America. Uh, they were every demographic, they were every... You know, every subculture, every everything that the wealth class has worked masterfully to pit us against each other with. There were white workers, black workers, male, female, uh, gay, lesbian, straight, all uh, everything. Married, single, uh, old, young, all of it. They were all there represented in these 55 people. And the majority actually voted for Donald Trump. But the one thing that everyone agreed upon in that moment, and this is where I stick to my lane. My lane is how do we make people's lives better? How do we make sure that they can put food on the table, keep a roof over their head, have some bit of health security, some bit of re retirement security? That's my lane. That's where I stick. That's where we, you, we can absolutely unite. This is where we can get things done. And in that moment, for that next month, all of those people were united around one idea. How do we make our lives better? Not just for me, not just for my family, but for your family and your family and your family. And all, how do we all do better? And this is where my mind has always been. I always try to put down the divisions in, in ways that are, are constructive. Look, I understand these are important to people and I'm not in any way diminishing their importance. But for me, how we move forward and we fix our society is by making it more equal economically, that people have opportunities, that people can get good quality union jobs with good wages, hours, conditions, family sustaining jobs with a future. That they can participate in the American dream of owning their own home, of, of, of taking a vacation, of putting their children through college, of leading that life that we were told was the American dream. For me, when that, if that happens, if we get to that utopian place, you know, where the, the MAGA people want to go, we're going to make America great again because it used to be back then. If we can do that for everybody and give everybody the opportunities that, you know, my grandparents' generation left to their children but do it more broadly, if we could do that, if we could share the wealth of this country and actually truly reward work, 
most of our divisions would go away. I truly believe that. Because here's the thing. It's been the last 20 years we've been focused on who goes to which bathroom or who loves who or who goes out to dinner with who or who does this or who does that. None of that stuff is new. We've always had it. It's always been with us. And I was explaining this to my son. We've always had these issues. We were just bigger boys and girls and and let people live their lives. Pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. That, that That's their lane. God bless them. We were focused on how do we make our lives better. And to me, what's going on right now, and I've been saying this for, for years now, what's going on right now is people feel like the hope of that American dream is gone. So now you're going to cling on to something else. Sure, I can't lead the life that I wanted to. I don't have the economic security. I don't have the opportunities going forward. So now, now I'm going to hold on to what little I have. And this is a problem. For me, you know, I look at the reality of corporate America doesn't care about our divisions. They don't care about which bathroom you go to. They don't care about who you sleep with. The very wealthy don't really care about it. What they care about, what they care about is keeping us focused on each other, on tearing each other apart. Because if we're tearing each other apart, they can continue to steal from us. And for me, the idea is we put aside our differences. That's your lane. You go, you stay there. I'm not going to tread in your, in your path. But that together, we unite on the idea that you're not going to continue to steal from us. Today, you're not going to steal from me. That's where we should be. That's where we should be heading. That should be where we, we put our anger and our frustration and all of this stuff. I don't care what flag you fly. I don't care if it's the LGBT flag. I don't care if it's the Black Lives Matter flag. We have one goal, making people's lives better. For me, that's the answer in this. Because if we're united, they can't steal from us. If we fight for the working class majority, lives get better. If we, the working class majority, unite around the idea that we want better wages, hours, conditions, we want better opportunities for our workforce and for our children when they enter the workforce, lives get better. And all of this anger will calm down. And then we can have serious conversations on how we deal with those problems. But none of that's allowed to happen as long as corporate America and the very wealthy continue to, well, exploit our lines of division. The more divided we are, the less opportunities we have. You know, the weird thing is, is we're told, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Sad reality is, it's not all that possible anymore. And you go, why not? Well, I'll tell you, it's because the bootstraps are made in China. And now they're they're made in China because, well, we bought into the corporate lies. We bought into all of the things that the conservative movement brought us. We need tax cuts for the wealthy because they know what to do. They're the job creators. Uh, we need deindustrialization. We need to move the, 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 the factories over to China or somewhere else so we can get cheaper stuff. Because, hey, you'll live better if you got cheaper stuff. Without thinking about, oh, hey, you know what? We don't have jobs. For me, all of this comes back full circle to the one one reality. We need better jobs. People need opportunities. I go back to my childhood. I grew up a minority in a minority community. I was one of the only white kids in an all-black neighborhood. Uh, We used to play this neat game called Chase the Kid and Beat White Kid and Beat Him Up. But what I saw firsthand, and it didn't matter, white or black, it didn't matter. When someone got that union job, and I saw it happen often, when people got that job at Ford or at Chevy or one of the feeder plants that were unionized that fed into those huge factories, their lives got better. They had food at the end of the month. I know, that's my, in my neighborhood, that was a big thing. The kids got better clothes. They got secondhand bikes. They bought a secondhand car. Eventually, 
They moved across the street into the little houses and then out of the neighborhood entirely. Their lives got progressively better because, and I'll steal a line from, from Ronald Reagan, the best anti-poverty program is a job. And I'll amend that to saying the best anti-poverty program is a union job with health care and with retirement security. Oh, and, and the original cancel culture being erased of at-will employment going by the wayside. You know, it's interesting that, you know, the, those on the right want to continue to say, well, you know, it's cancel culture. We've always had a form of cancel culture. It's always been the wealthy canceling us entirely by kicking us to the curb whenever at their will. So for me, the idea in all of this, and I know this is hard to sometimes get aside, but for me, the answer in all of this is we need to make people's lives better. When people have hope and opportunity, when there's a future that they can see, we're less divided. I don't think that's hard to figure out. So for me, it all comes back down to the economics. Uh, I would like to see the Biden administration move forward on a very large infrastructure bill that's going to employ people. Lots of people. White people, black people, women, men, gay, straight, doesn't matter. People who need jobs to support them and their families. We can do that because we've done it in the past. We've been able to do this. And in fact, you know, I was telling my son the other day that, you know, I first came across uh, tra a transgender person back, you know, 25, almost 30 years ago. Uh, in the workplace that I was at, you know, this person went on vacation as a man, came back as a woman and everyone went, hmm, okay. There was no big deal. There was no end of society. There was no God's going to strike us down. There was that person got, went to work, went, did their job, got paid the same wage, got the health care. Everyone moved on. I would love to see that happen again. I'd love to see a time where we, as my grandfather would always say, don't worry about me, worry about yourself. I wish there was a time where we'd be worrying about ourselves, taking care of our families and, and keeping a roof over their head and, and thinking about our security as opposed to, well, I can't have health care because I don't want them to have it, which is just insane to me. I'd love to hear your thoughts, though. You can email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Got lots to get to. Quick break, right back after this. Stick around and listen to The Rick Smith Show. Nothing more American than workers standing up And the union gives a voice to win On The Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day the despised Taft-Hartley Act became law. It was a direct retaliatory response to the 1946 post-war strike wave where millions walked off the job after waiting years for basic demands. The labor movement mobilized against the slave labor bill through numerous rallies. The AFL joined the CIO in threatening 24-hour strikes across whole industries in protest as the bill wound its way through Congress. 11,000 soft coal miners in Pennsylvania walked out in a spontaneous protest strike earlier in the month. The bill passed over the veto of President Harry S. Truman, who would invoke it a dozen times over the course of his presidency. Many union leaders hailed Truman as a friend of labor for his 11th hour veto. Labor Party advocates were incensed that of the 219 congressional Democrats, 126 voted in favor of the bill. Practically overnight, the labor movement had been pushed back 25 years. Taft-Hartley was nothing short of disastrous for the American labor movement. With the stroke of a pen, the act criminalized many of the actions key to historic union victories in the 30s and 40s. Jurisdictional strikes, secondary boycotts, solidarity strikes, closed shops, and mass picketing were just a few of the most basic trade union activities now outlawed. 
the act helped fire the first shots of the McCarthy Red Scare by mandating that union officers file non-communist affidavits with the government, which was later found to be unconstitutional. The act also provided the ammunition needed to strangle strikes by empowering the president to easily acquire strike-breaking injunctions. And it allowed for the rapid growth of right-to-work laws at the state level. And because of Taft-Hartley, the union movement has suffered ever since. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So a little fun in North Carolina. You may remember, may remember this, 2016, 2018 guy named Leslie McCray Dowless. Remember that name? Does that name pop into your ear? He was the guy who was running around uh, collecting up ballots from folks, and he was helping them, you know, helping them fill them in, uh, and then forging their name and putting them in. You know, voter fraud. Uh, but he was doing it for a Republican, and I guess that was okay, uh, which is how the Republican got elected there in the 9th Congressional District, that Mark Harris guy. Uh, but evidently, yesterday, uh, Dallas pled, entered a plea of guilty to theft of government property and social security fraud. Evidently, while he was out committing crimes of stealing votes and, and voter fraud, he was actually being paid by the campaigns and the federal government. Oops, uh, that is a crime. Now, uh, he's going to plead guilty to that from what we're told. Uh, we'll f- find out what his sentence is. He could face up to 15 years in prison. He also still faces charges for the, the voter fraud from 16 and 18. Yeah, uh, well, I got to tell you, find it very interesting. Republicans are claiming all this voter fraud, especially when you look at Ohio. You go, what the heck, Ohio? Uh, in fact, a guy named Edward Snodgrass, Uh, He's a trustee in Porter Township, Ohio. He has admitted, yeah, he committed voter fraud. Uh, I guess his father passed away. He was doing him a favor. He was his final wish, his final wish to commit voter fraud. Uh, Yeah, uh, he's going to be sentenced as well. We'll see how that plays out. Anyway, here to talk about real voter suppression and what states are doing across the country to ensure that people do not vote. I look at Ohio and some of their their tactics. That's why I've invited uh, Ohio State Representative Tavia Galonsky to come talk with us. Tavia represents the 35th district in Ohio, former sister teamster, also the chair of the Ohio Women's Caucus. Tavia, thanks for taking time for us. Ah, thank you for having me. This is great. It's a, a bad reason to be here, but I'm always uh, excited to talk to you. So the voter fraud exists, Tavia. Uh, we've, we have found yeah. it. The problem is it's the people who keep claiming that there's voter fraud. <laughs> Yeah, that thou dost protest too much. And so sure enough, once again, corruption runs rampant in Ohio. We're 30 to 40 years of full-on GOP corruption, and it just doesn't end. So last week, you know, I watched as Householder was finally, you know, escorted out. And, you know, so that's one, one step of corruption. And then I hear about GOP corruption when actually they've been looking for all this voter fraud and they found it amongst their own leagues. So, you know, if we don't stay on top of them, they're headed, we're headed in the wrong direction. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight, um, which is House Bill 294. Once again, Ohio getting in the news for all the wrong reasons. No, yeah, but Ohio, another one of those those Republicans. It's a Republican state. I hate to say it. I, I was born and raised in, in Cleveland. Uh, when I was there, uh, it was a solidly Democratic state. Had two of the best mm-hmm. senators, John Glenn and Howard Metzenbaum, that you could possibly have. Uh, and then all craziness broke loose because we lost... Well, we didn't lose. We gave away our manufacturing base and all those good union jobs left and left people desperate and and angry. And this is how I think we've gotten to the point that we're at right now. I agree completely. But what I think what I also notice is happening is more people are tuned in to the crazy talk and not really tuned into what's going on at their state legislature, because I think if people understood that in particular, um, they're definitely trying to roll back your rights and your ability to vote here in Ohio. And it's really just voter suppression. And, you know, in the testimony that we've heard, people are so angry that we're calling it voter suppression. Well, when you take away 400 hours of my being able to go to a drop ballot, a uh, drop, uh, uh, drop, drop ballot box, then I, uh, you know, you're suppressing my vote because you're telling me that if I come in on the 11th day, I can't, 
vote um, in that drop box that's right there at the Board of Elections. I got to get my grandchild out of the back seat and I got to, you know, bring them in only to give it to someone who could have been just watching the Dropbox. It, it doesn't make sense. And so, you know, there are just so many ways that, unfortunately, Ohio is rolling back um, to the bad old days. And it's just disappointing. No, it is disappointing. But this is the plan. I mean, this is yep. uh, the the GOP plan of going forward in 2022. It's how they're going to, uh, to hold on to some bit of power, especially in a state like Ohio, where... Uh, if, uh, in my view, if Biden does get an infrastructure plan through, we create those good jobs, people start going, hey, things are going in the right direction, uh, Republicans got a problem. Uh, but what I find interesting is, you know, both of your senator, your, your, your Senator Rob Portman voted against uh, the For the People Act yesterday. Obviously, Sherrod Brown voted for it. Um, but you know, you, you've got all of this push by Republicans saying, no, no, it's a bad bill. It's, it's suppressing our ability to suppress the, your right to vote. It's, it's really just this weird kind of moment. We're talking about bipartisanship. we got to have all this stuff. Yet in a state like Ohio and Georgia and others, um, there isn't any of that. Well, and, and that's the sad thing is because any of the polling, if you look at here in Ohio, 49% of the people you know, are basically voting with Democrats and 51%, you know, voting with Republicans. But here's the thing. We're all in the same place. If you do any of the polling on where people want um, to be able to vote, safe and accessible voting is all people say over and over again. Not once does anyone say, hey, you should cut down on some of those hours, you know, at the polling locations. No one says that. People believe that we can have, you know, it's it's one or the other. Our Secretary of State says out of one side of his mouth, well, 2020 was one of the best run elections. You know, look at everything we did and let's put in some measures to make sure people can't vote conveniently. And it's just one more, you know, it's just one more hassle and one more hurdle, which concerns me because if Ohio keeps doing these things, no one's going to want to come here and live the Ohio promise. I mean, you could live the American dream right here in Ohio that you can live safely and securely work, work, live, retire here in Ohio and live the American dream. But why would I want to come here if my dream is really just a nightmare? And all I'm talking about is, how many t- how many pieces of literature do I need in order to sh- show proof of ID before I can vote here? Yeah, and this is one of those things that that I've gotten into over the years, of you know people being for or against voter ID, and I'm not I'm not entirely against the idea. Uh, my problem is is that that you know I I have lived in in different areas throughout my life. Uh, I I grew up in a very poor neighborhood where very few people had cars or driver's license. Uh, so getting an ID is something that was, you know, probably uh, a difficult thing. So people used, you know, their 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 electric bill or whatever. For me, it's it's about very more forms of identification being available rather than you know we we have nobody showing ID because we want to make sure people are legally al- able to vote. We I don't think anyone's against that. My problem is, is right. how restrictive they have gotten because they know yeah. we can exclude poor people. Well, and don't forget, you know, when GOP corruption comes to town, they can't wait to talk out of both sides of their mouth. So what they present here in Ohio is, hey, you know, we're just making, you know, we're asking for voter ID and we're making it more simple. Nope. Let's go the other direction, folks. It's really actually more complex. When you require a three-tiered method of determining if your ID is the right ID, so you need two different forms of ID in order to opt in on voter um, automatic registration, that's not automatic to me. And I think a lot of Ohio voters are going to be unpleasantly surprised if um, House Bill 294 becomes law. And, you know, the other thing to that, you know, we, we've got to throw in the mix here is, You know, the GOP just wants all the cake and they want to eat it, too. So what they've done is not only as householder who is facing, um, uh, you know, who's facing an indictment on 61 million dollars in the largest bribery scheme in Ohio's uh, history. But now uh, the GOP just made it so that he gets to pick where he's he's going to be prosecuted. So, yeah, they passed, a, you know, introduced a, a bill so that, you know, the defendant for the only time in Ohio history now can pick, well, you know, hey, maybe wow. I'd like to be prosecuted back at home. So it's like the, the corruption hits just keep coming. And so I think while people are, you know, just trying to work, live, retire, live the American dream, all they have is a bunch of 
you know, laws that are being passed to just make it harder on them. And I can't understand this corruption. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, and, and you're talking about Larry Householder, who was former Speaker yeah. of the House there in Ohio. Uh, as you said, you know, $61 million corruption scheme uh, because of the, they gave a bunch of money to one of the, one of the nuclear power companies, right? Well, and that's the allegation is that, at, but unbeknownst to any of us, you know, he was setting up this whole scheme not just to get that bill passed, but actually to become speaker. So he had the wheels turning on this, you know, years in the making. You know, and if we were to believe the indictments, you know, he he was doing all that with um, with large sums of money from an unnamed company. Um, and, you know, here we go. Ohio, corruption, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. You know, when are people going to get tired of it? And so here we are. We're all sitting here. And, and 60, almost $61 million um, just handed to the taxpayers. And he was actually outraged that he would be ousted. And, you know, really, his buddies only finally ousted him because the Democrats actually filed when we gave notice to them that we were going to file to have him ousted. And so they swooped in to save the day and decided they were going to oust him on his own. But what took him so long, right? Yeah. So, you know, here we are. We're just wallowing in corruption, and it's just making us all look bad. You know, as public servants, we are responsible for public trust. And how can people trust us if they continue to watch that these this bribery scheme, the largest in Ohio history, along with just years of corruption, that, uh, compounded by additional bills? that keep getting passed how can people have confidence in the public servants and See, that's what we thing. want to bring back Here, here's my theory on this tavia and you can you can disagree with me if you have to uh whenever republicans have these scandals their base doesn't care because they think they think government is bad anyway and can't do anything and shouldn't yep. be doing anything so there well, isn't really the kind of punishment because republicans tell their their voters Government is bad. Government doesn't yeah. work. It's all corrupt. And we're going to show we're going to show you how corrupt it is by being as corrupt as we can possibly <laughs> be. So don't hold it's us accountable true. when we are, because we told you and you voted for us anyway. And, and you know, that's such a good point, because what it is, is it assumes that Ohio is like, uh, you know, Charlie Brown continuing to kick the football if Lucy pulls it away. And so what's, what a sad statement, what a cynical viewpoint that you would have about your own voters. And what I choose to believe is that actually these are not low information voters. These are high information voters. And I think Ohioans are sick of it. And I think Hope part so. of that is tomorrow we'll be on the lawn of the state house and we're going to have people bust in from all over the state, from the north, the south, the east and the west. People are coming to say no. We don't believe that you should try to sh shove down our throats yet another piece of corruption, which is taking away your ability to vote safely and, and securely. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask you about that, because uh, this is the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. Uh, and, and look, when we did our civil rights tour back in 2015, we ended up down in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and we're, we were at the bus terminal where the Freedom Riders came in and were ultimately rounded up and thrown into, into prison because they had the audacity to show up. And we met a guy who was a 15-year-old kid back then uh, who got swept up and thrown into Parchment Prison for, uh, for a, a couple of days with a rapist and a murderer. And he was happy that the rapist protected it, or the murderer protected him from, from getting raped and loved the Republican uh -huh. governor, by the way, who got him out of jail. Uh, so interesting tale. But, you know, the, the 60th anniversary of this, you know, and, and what a great time to revive that history of fighting for people's rights to be able to vote. Exactly. And that's the whole point of this freedom to vote tour is that we're, you know, we're, we're gathering up the usual suspects, the people who have been in the trenches, and we're adding them to the young kids. So young people have contacted me. They're all on board. They're going to be on these buses, and they're going to be out there tomorrow letting people know we're not letting you take away our voter accessibility without a fight. And so, again, this is organic. It, it isn't as if we suggested it. It's the people who have called for us. First of all, as you probably know, we did our voter tour. So we went all over Ohio and just listened to Ohioans with what they want and how outraged they were by the attempted passing of 294. And then the next step is the voter rally tomorrow. And so we're anticipating a huge crowd. We've got our union brothers and sisters engaged. We've got um, the teachers. We've got you know the manufacturers. We've just got people coming out tomorrow to just let um, our uh, 
you know, our, our Republican colleagues know that they're not standing for this. Now, that bill is not scheduled for a vote or for a hearing. But guess what? We got other difficult stuff that's going to be voted on. So what we're hoping is people can see what we're doing on the lawn and then they come into the state house and participate in their government by letting their voice be heard on a lot of these other bills that are just no good. Yeah, no, it, it, a lot of bad ideas out there. I mean, they're banging around in yeah. our state, too. Uh, the difference yeah. is, is here in Pennsylvania, we've got a, a Democratic governor who will veto these bad ideas. Uh, but exactly. look, in 2022, if if a Republican wins as, as governor here, uh, 2023, we're we're going to be competing with you for most corrupt in the in the country. You know that, right? <laughs> I hear you. You know, and and I don't know. So far, Ohio's got you beat on that, and it's an embarrassing statement. You know, I don't know when we're going to clean up the corruption here, but I'm fighting every day. Now, I know you are. So last line of questioning I've got for you, because, look, I, I, like you said, I, I haven't met anyone who said, no, no, we need to we need to you know, strengthen the ability to deny people the right to vote. Everybody I talk to face to face says, look, we everyone, every citizen, every American citizen has the right to the, the ballot box and we should yeah. make it accessible. I, I, most people I talk to think it's crazy that we run our entire this entire experiment of self government governance on on a single Tuesday between you know 7 and yeah. 7 p.m. that we should be expanding. We've got technology. We've got ways of making it easier. Yes. And we should be doing that. Right. I agree. And you know while we're while we're celebrating different holidays, how about giving people election day off? The people that I know in the 35th district, they shower when they get home at night. And so these people are not looking for a handout, but what they are looking for, they want to continue to work. They want to be able to be at work on time, et cetera. But they're also, you know, they would really appreciate having time to vote. So now with this House Bill 294, they're going to cut off um, voting on Monday before Election Day. Well, you know, that a lot of people can't do a lot of planning. I have a lot of flexibility with my job, but they can't do all that planning. They don't get their schedule in advance. And so they're going to have to try to figure out a way to dodge around all these plans, you know, and the long lines. I mean, the lines are going to be incredible. They already were huge for 2020, but now with the reduction in hours of the drop boxes, then, you know, that's going to mean longer lines. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure any of this out. Yeah. It's about suppressing the vote. Yeah, as where I've always said, we need to expand the number of representatives we have. We need to yep. shrink the number of people that they represent. And we need to get politicians back to the people and make it more accessible that we have those kind of conversations. And, and uh, you know, the access to the ballot box uh, equally important. Uh, but we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm glad that folks like you are out there fighting the fight. Uh, Tavia, I appreciate the time. And, and uh, tomorrow, uh, keep it up on the lawn there with the Freedom, Freedom Riders come to town. Um, it should right. be an exciting day. Will do. Hey, thank you so much. Good stuff, as always. Our good friend, Ohio State Representative Tavia Golonsky. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, interesting to see how the, this this convergence on Washington, D.C. is going to going to come about. Let's take a quick break right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day that many labor historians mark as the beginning of a long decline of the U.S. labor movement. The United States Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act. The bill was named after Republican Senator Robert A. Taft from Ohio. The son of President William Howard Taft, the senator had been a staunch opponent of President Roosevelt's New Deal policies. He continued his anti-working class efforts with a new new bill aimed to curb the power of unions. He found an ally in Representative Fred Hartley, a Republican congressman from New Jersey. After World War II, a wave of strikes washed over the nation. Most labor unions had agreed not to go on strike during the war. But frustrations over wages and working conditions mounted. In the years after the conflict ended, five million workers walked the picket lines. 
One in four private sector workers was a union member. Labor was on the march. The Congressional Republicans passed the Taft-Hartley Act in response. The bill ushered in limits on the right to strike. It also began the era of so-called right to work, allowing states to pass laws, making it more difficult for unions to collect dues and represent workers. The new law also required union leaders to sign affidavits that they were not communists, bringing the Red Scare to the House of Labor. A massive rally at Madison Square Garden in New York City asked President Truman to veto the slave labor bill. President Truman did veto the bill, but Congress overrode his veto. Today, only 12% of workers are in unions. 26 states are so-called right-to-work states, to the great detriment of workers' living standards and their health and safety. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, my pa- my Senator, Pat Toomey, uh, after voting against beginning debate, now mind you, this wasn't voting for the For the People Act. This was just a vote to go, hey, let's debate this. Uh, let's find out what's in it. Let's, let's, let's argue over it. He voted against that. But after voting against it, he said, S1 is a power grab that would effectively nullify state voter ID laws, mandate public funding of political campaigns, and transform the elector, the Federal Elections Commission, into a partisan body empowered to limit free speech. He said, this is a bad bill, which is why I voted no. And my my question was simple. Did I miss the debate where you... You raise these questions on the Senate floor and someone said, no, no, that's not right. You're wrong, sir. And then you went back and forth. That's how debate works. We used to do that kind of stuff when we voted to have debate. Sad, sad day. Again, why I think we need to do something with the filibuster. Uh, here to sp- sp- here to talk. Is this, is the For the People Act really going to limit our free speech? Is it going to steal our right to vote? Is it going to be the Armageddon of democracy? Um, I don't think so, but here to share some thoughts. I've asked Adam Smith to come talk with us. Uh, Adam is the Strategic Partnerships Director there at End Citizens United, their website, endcitizensunited.org. Adam, thanks for taking time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So it's the end of democracy as we know it if we give people the right to wait a minute. Uh, um, am I missing something here? No, here's the thing. If anything, the For the People Act will actually expand speech, right? Like if we ensure uniform national standards for voting, we make sure everybody can vote without obstacles, that expands speech. If we ensure that like small donors have a bigger voice in politics, that expands speech. It diversifies who can run and win office. You know, if we make sure that like dark money um, is disclosed, That makes sure people know who's trying to influence their votes. The For the People Act expands speech. And the thing is, just as Senator Toomey was saying all those all those wrong things, Pennsylvania Republicans were trying to pass a bill to make it harder to vote. Right. Like it's just it is a bad argument. And we know it's a bad argument because they wouldn't even begin debate on it. If they wanted to have a debate on this bill and and talk about the speech uh, implications of it, they should have voted to begin debate so we could do that. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah, now, t- t- you say this is the, the For the People Act will expand uh, speech. And and I guess the question is, uh, and like everything, for who? You know, who is it that we're expanding it for? Who is it that we're not? And the reality is, this is w- w- which side are you on question? Uh, Pat Toomey likes the fact that the billionaire class, uh, our, our wealthy 600 folks who have such outweighed power in our political system and these giant corporations who dominate the, uh, the halls of power, that they maintain their power and they maintain their their ability to buy our system. We've got the best democracy money can buy. Uh, that's who he's focused on. Uh, you keep talking about us little people who give like five bucks to a candidate and actually go and vote and care. Yeah, they. Yeah. He, I don't think he's caring about us. Right. What Republicans are doing is trying to maintain the status quo, right? They like the system as it is. Um, for the most part, they've done really well under the current system. We have the Democrats have the 
barest majority right now. And they want to make sure that they get back to being in power. And the way to do that is by blocking these important reforms. You know, um, one thing it's that 70 percent of Americans voted earlier or by mail in the 2020 election. Right. And so what we're, and what we're saying is that's great. Let's make sure that happens again by setting national rules for things like early voting and vote by mail, because across the country, state lawmakers are undermining that. They are rolling back the policies that led to this record turnout. And we're saying they shouldn't do that. And more people uh, should be able to make their voices heard in elections. No, I'm right there with you. And this is where, you know, Joe Manchin's demand that things have to be bipartisan. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous on, on this level, because while on the federal level, we're saying, no, no, we need to all hold hands and, and get along on the state level. Republicans are like, yeah, you keep doing that. And we're going to run the steamroller right over top of you. Yeah, it is. And you'll notice I might you'll notice I have a West Virginia license plate behind me. I'm actually a West Virginian. I grew up there. My family's still there. And um, so this is a important fight to me. And, um, you know, it's. The one thing about this is if you look at the polling, you know, the only place it's really partisan is in Congress and state legislatures. Like Americans broadly believe in our like in the freedom to vote. They believe in one person one vote. They don't they they're tired of corruption in politics. And another thing, a lot of the provisions in the For the People Act have historically had bipartisan support. The uh the bill voted on on Tuesday had um, you know, uh, listen to feedback from local election administrators and to people like Joe Manchin and to others who said that we need to make changes. And um, things like early voting and vote by mail has historically not been a partisan issue. The reason we have vote by mail in Florida is Republicans instituted it because they thought it would help them. And now all of a sudden, because of the big lie, we're rolling all that stuff back. No, And, and that's a, a perfect point. But, you know, it, it, yesterday, did you find it as weird as I did that, that Chuck Schumer made such a big deal out of, you know, Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer struck a deal that, you know, they're going to water down this so that Manchin can vote for it so that you can have all 50 Democrats being for it. And look, I understand the optics and all that only to have minutes later to have him go, well, you know, we're going to vote for it, but it's not going anywhere because we don't have 10 Republicans to come along and we're doing nothing uh, to, yeah. to do with the filibuster just so we can begin debate. I mean, this isn't, this isn't even, this isn't, we're not talking about passing it. We're talking about talking about passing it. Yeah. Listen, it, this was always going to be really hard, you know, but I will say two weeks ago, Joe, we all woke up to an op-ed from Joe Manchin saying, I won't support the For the People Act. And then yesterday he said, I'm going to vote to begin debate on this and I'm negotiating to get up to a policy that I like. And I think that we're still moving in the right direction. And um, the filibuster is absolutely still in the way. And I think that um, there's a lot of organizing happening in West Virginia by a lot of important, by a lot of activists. People are knocking on doors, they're making phone calls, um, and all that stuff is happening around the country. So, um, you know, we're going to push forward. And I think there's going to be a point where people have to decide, you know, that, that what's happening in the state legislatures is partisan, is a partisan attack on the right to vote. And we shouldn't have to have a bipartisan response to a partisan attack. And we're going to make that. We're going to figure that out. Um, you know, I will say, um, as the filibuster debate continues, um, one fact I think is really interesting is there have been 161 exceptions made to the filibuster over time. 161. This thing has changed over time. Whether that's reconciliation, trade agreements, Congressional Review Act, the filibuster isn't set in stone. People have made changes changes to it for years. And I think that. Um, some people have some decisions to make over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. See now, from the beginning, I, you know, I remember the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to where that was on TV a couple times. I watched it. Um, I, I thought that's how a filibuster worked. You got up, you held the floor, you talked until you couldn't. You either got laryngitis or your bladder exploded. One of the two things. But we, we didn't, we don't do that. I'm in favor of returning to a day where if it is that important that we have to stop it, that you have to hold the floor and nothing else gets done. We debate, debate, debate. That is what our system is founded on. Not this idea going, no, we're not going to vote for it. So we're not going to open up debate, which is insane to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I would love to have a debate with Republicans about why they don't think we should uh, disclose dark money donations, about why Republicans don't think people should be able to vote early, about why they think 
people shouldn't be able to vote by mail. Or, you know, there's a bunch of other stuff in this bill. It says members of Congress can't sit on corporate boards, right? It says elected officials shouldn't be able to go right to lobby, uh, become corporate lobbyists after they leave Congress. I love to have a debate on all those, and I don't think Republicans would. Do they want to sit up there for days at a time and defend all of these defenseless positions? I don't think so. And that's why we need to move to debate and start discussion, discussing this on the Senate floor. Yeah, I would love to hear Pat Toomey explain to me his theory on on limiting free speech. Uh, I would I would love to hear that. And we're being cheated out of that. We're being cheated out of hearing what our representatives truly believe by hiding behind this vote. And this is this is what's frustrating to me because I want to hear people tell me why they're against all of the things they've filibustered. The things that have been important uh, to me over the years, labor law reform, Republicans have filibustered. Bob Dole filibustered the strike replacement bill back during the, the Clinton years. It was uh, the, the repeal of Taft-Hartley filibustered back during the Carter years. Hell, we didn't even get them to filibuster the Employee Free Choice Act because they were afraid it would be filibustered. I mean, this is one of those things where the Senate seems to be that arena where good ideas and progress go to die. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And it, it shouldn't be, right? Uh, Americans turned out in record numbers to deliver a Democratic majority based on the agenda they offered, which included things like protecting the right to vote. And we should be able to legislate. They should be able to deliver on those demands. And, um, you know, the... The, the issue, of course, right now is that these are the things Republicans are doing in state legislatures is anti-democratic, little d democratic. You know, it's anti-democracy. And we have to respond right now. Now is the time. We cannot wait. They are not going to stop. You've seen the weird audit stuff happening in Arizona. You've seen uh, Texas, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. They're all still moving and th they're not going to stop. And that's why we have to set these national standards. And Democrats have to do whatever it takes to get them signed into law. Now, what's interesting to me is, you know, I've, I've pointed out over the last you know several weeks where the voter fraud is, because we keep hearing that big lie, don't we? There's mass voter fraud out there. And yet every story I keep hearing coming across, it's a Republican doing it. So it's one of these things where we know there's voter, voter fraud out there because we're doing it. Well, and the thing is, they keep finding it. That's the thing about voter fraud is people don't do it. And the really rare times that they are, it is really easy to find people who are doing it and they are prosecuted for it. And uh, like, I think that's a really important part of this is uh, voter fraud is rare, but they do it in such dumb ways. And, you know, that one guy in Pennsylvania during the election, like came back wearing a hat and sunglasses, <laughs> trying to vote for his son. Like, come on, people are going to catch you. And um, it, it's a, just a bad excuse to prevent to make it harder for other people to vote because of these rare examples. No, it's crazy to me. Uh, but again, you know, you know, as we, we, you know, we, we look at our system for me, it still comes back to the money. It comes to the obscene amount of money. And I've said for the longest time, we should be banning corporate money completely. Uh, I don't think corporations should be involved in the political system. I, we should be banning, uh, you know, lobbying and that stuff from corporate America. Um, but, you know, it's the money that's gotten us into this mess. And you go back to Citizens United when you know, when a lot of this stuff accelerated and got much crazier. Uh, because, you know, when I was a kid, it wasn't quite like this. You had more participatory democracy. You had more engagement. Now it's about, you know, well, you know, it's about how much money you can raise from big dollar donors. And and, and at some point, we've got to, we've got to put that aside. Because, look, today's the anniversary of of Taft-Hartley being uh, rammed into law by Republicans and a number of Southern Democrats. Uh, one of the first things that Taft-Hartley did was silence unions' ability to spend dues dollars on politics. You know, and we keep hearing people say this, Adam. Well, unions just want dues dollars to spend on politics. Even though it's been illegal for 74 years, they're still saying, no, no, they're spending dues dollars on politics. Even though it's been illegal for 74 years. I say that again for the people in the back. Uh, at some point, we've got to do the same thing that, that they did to, to labor to these big corporations and to the big moneyed interest and return democracy back to us. Yeah, we just got to level the playing field, right? Like, you know, this is like in 2010, where Republicans took the Wisconsin, took full power in Wisconsin, what did they do immediately? They undermined voting rights, they undermined labor unions, 
and they undermine the state's campaign finance system because this is all the same fight, right? It's all about who has power. And that's, I mean, that's why the For the People Act, this stuff is less talked about. For the People Act has a bunch of money and politics provisions in it, right? It has dark money. It has a small donor matching fund system. It, it closes a bunch of loopholes with regards to super PACs. It restructures the FEC so that it actually is able to do the job and enforce our campaign finance laws. Because, you know, protecting the freedom to vote ensuring that billionaires aren't buying elections, that regular people have a voice in our elections are two sides of the same coin. Who has a voice on election day and who has a voice in the policymaking process after that? No, now there are a lot of movements going on right now. You know, in the last segment, we talked about the freedom riders who are coming to DC uh, all across the country. People are, you know, people of color are jumping on buses and saying, we want to protect our right to vote, you know, with the 60th anniversary of the freedom rides uh, today, Reverend William Barber, uh, was arrested in D.C. along with 20 other people uh, for you know, obstructing traffic uh, in front of the Hart Senate building uh, as they were engaging in the moral march on on Mansion and McConnell to highlight uh, the need to, to have some effective reform. Uh, do you see this getting much more, much more people taking to the streets more and this becoming a much more activist kind of kind of movement going forward? Absolutely, we're we're calling it. We're having a voting rights summer. You know, they I think that what happening today with Reverend Barber um, tomorrow, there's a big rally at the Capitol Saturday. The, the Freedom Riders are going to be in Washington, D.C. Um, Indivisible and a bunch of groups are launching what they're called Deadline for Democracy um, around July 4th. All the Indivisible chapters in big cities, cities small towns across the country are going to be having a bunch of rallies and um, activities to sort of show that there's this this really broad national push. I mean, just this Monday in Montana, the capital of Montana, there was a hundred uh, uh, For the People Act uh, protesters at the Capitol. You know, there's uh, a big rally in West Virginia tomorrow. Um, people are absolutely activating. I think it's been really exciting to see people believe this stuff. They want it to happen and they know how important it is. Let me ask you a last line of questioning because I've had someone go, why, why don't you just spend the activity, the, the, the effort that you're doing for, for all of this just to get people signed up, um, you know, make sure that they got IDs, make sure they do that. What's the response to that? Sure. I mean, one, yes, we have to, in a lot of these states, that's what we've had to do is out-organize. What Stacey Abrams and activists in Georgia did was out-organize, right? And that, and we can do that. We have to do that, but they will keep coming up with new ways to make it harder to vote, right? That we can't, uh, we can only do so much um, and we shouldn't have to, right? We shouldn't have to go with all through all these hoops and extra effort just to sign someone up to vote. And, um, and, and so, yeah, yes, all that stuff is really important. We will do what we need to do um, to get people turned out, but we shouldn't have to, and people should it should be easy and convenient for people to vote. Yeah, I mean, we should be encouraging people to participate in their democracy. Uh, because, look, I've always said you, you can't complain if you didn't vote. And we all complain, so everyone should vote. And what I've said, and I, and I hope someone someday will listen, I, I think what we should be doing is we should be signing. Once you turn 18, uh, when I was 18, I had to go to the post office to sign up for selective service. I go to the post office, sign up for selective service, and sign up to vote and that sign up is my right to vote until i die seems seems sane seems rational it's something we should be moving towards but adam i appreciate the time and the work you guys are doing there uh, at n citizens united I hope folks will check out the website and citizens united.org we'll get links out on social media how they can check that out but uh, thanks so much for taking time for us yeah thanks for having me good stuff adam smith quick break right back after this stick around you listen to the rick smith show Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Chances are you've heard of black lung, the deadly disease that threatens coal miners. But have you ever heard of brown lung? On this day in labor history, the year was 1978. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, adopted standards to fight this workplace hazard. Brown lung is caused by breathing in cotton dust. Sometimes the condition was known as Monday fever. Workers in textile mills, especially mills with poor ventilation, are at risk from brown lung. Health officials first recognized the potential 
potential threat of brown lung in the 1930s. But it took almost half a century for comprehensive federal workplace safety standards to be implemented on this issue. At the time the new regulations were passed, it was estimated that 35,000 workers suffered from brown lung. This meant that 1 in 12 workers in the industry suffered from this agonizing disease with another 100,000 workers at risk. Symptoms of brown lung include coughing, wheezing, and difficulty breathing. Severe cases can result in heart failure and death. From 1974 until 1986, the not-for-profit group the Brown Lung Association organized around this workplace safety issue. The organization worked primarily in the Carolinas, but also did outreach in Virginia and Georgia. The Brown Lung Association held its first breathing clinic at a church in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1975. It went on to hold similar clinics in other southern cities. The group ran media and lobbying campaigns to bring attention to the issue. They also helped workers file compensation claims. Thanks to OSHA and groups like the Brown Lung Association, in the 1990s, the number of deaths attributed to brown lung had fallen to 81. According to OSHA, the instances of brown lung have fallen to 0.01 cases per 10,000 workers. The fight to end brown lung is just one part of the struggle to ensure workplace safety in the United States. The past year proves that a lot of conventional economic wisdom is neither true nor wise. For example, we don't have the money. The power elites tell us it would be nice to do the big ticket reforms America needs, but the money just isn't there. Then a pandemic slammed into America and suddenly trillions of dollars gushed out of Washington for everything from subsidizing meat packers to developing vaccines, revealing that the money is there. We can't increase the federal debt. Yet, Trump and the Republican Congress didn't hesitate to shove the national debt through the roof in 2017 to let a few corporations and billionaires pocket a trillion-dollar tax giveaway. So, if those drunken spenders can use federal borrowing to make the likes of Amazon and Zuckerberg richer, we can borrow funds for such productive national needs as infrastructure investment and quality education for all. The rich are the makers who contribute the most to society. This silly myth quickly melted right in front of us as soon as Senior Coronavirus arrived, making plain that the most valuable people are nurses, grocery clerks, teachers, postal employees, and millions of other mostly low-wage people. So let's capitalize on the moment to demand policies that reward these grassroots makers instead of Wall Street's billionaire takers. Tax cuts drive economic growth for all. They always claim that freeing corporations from the burden of taxes will encourage CEOs to invest in worker productivity and voila, wages will miraculously rise. This scam has never worked for anyone but the scammers, and it's now obvious to the great majority of workers that the way to increase wages, hello, is to increase wages. This is Jim Hightower saying, percolate up economics works. Trickle Down does not. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by the Lowdown Happy Hour, live streamed from the Chat and Chew Cafe. Details at HightowerLowdown.org. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, 74 years ago today, Taft Hartley became the law of the land. Republicans and a whole lot of Southern Democrats uh, overrode a Harry Truman's veto to pass uh, Robert Taft from Ohio, the senator's uh, proposed plan, and Republican Congressman Fred Hartley's of New Jersey's plan to, to weaken unions and to prevent strikes. And you know what? 74 years later, mission freaking accomplished uh, because union density in this country is almost where it was when it was illegal. Uh, and the number of strikes, well, sadly, those have gone into almost nowhere land as well. A little tick here recently, a good sign of, of some health. But still, when the law is this badly stacked against you, uh, not good things. And here to share some thoughts on the 74th anniversary and just what this has meant uh, to the to the working class of this country and maybe where we go from here in the future. I've asked our good friend Eric Loomis to come talk with us. Uh, Eric is a professor of, of history there at the 
Rhode Island, University of Rhode Island. He's also the director of graduate studies there. Um, more importantly, he's he's one of the guys over at the Lawyers, Guns, Money blog. Uh, fabulous stuff you got to check out. Uh, Eric, thanks for taking time for us. Hey, thanks for having me on. So not a good, not a good anniversary. Uh, 74 years. I, I kept saying that. I'm going, 74 years. That is a long freaking time to deal with the kind of horrible law that this has been without anything making it better. Yeah, it's it's the it's the human lifespan, you know. Um, basically, it's the three score and ten, the the classic 70 years of a human life is, is as long as this has been on the books. And I think it, you know, demonstrates um you know, just how limited union power has been in American history. Um, it, it demonstrates the power of corporations to control this nation's politics. Um, and it uh, demonstrates the difficulties in organizing the American public uh, for better better law and, and for worker rights. So it's, it's a sad anniversary. I, I wish I was here to talk about something a little happier, but such is the world in which we live. Yeah, I always talk about, you know, the fact, and I talk about it from my own personal experience. Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate. Uh, every job that I've had has been a union job uh, that I have a sense of empowerment, not just in the workplace, but also in our society. And, and I think having that kind of of backing, being part of a labor union gives you that that kind of sense of empowerment, not just at work, but also in society as a whole. Uh, and that's something corporate America doesn't want. Yeah, you know, no question. I mean, I'm a union member as well. And you know, my union has had my back when I've had right wingers attack me. And uh, I think that's absolutely right, that being a member of a union gives you power over your employer. Um, you know, doesn't doesn't mean you have all the power, but you have more power than a non-union worker has. And that's something that corporations can't stand. It gives you power in the political world. It provides a organization or an umbrella by which workers can be educated about the world in a way that does not just promote the employer's perspective. Of course, corporations hate all of this, right? They hate, and, and not just corporations, but just employers generally, whether it's public sector or private sector, they hate this, right? And this is why uh, you have this uh, gigantic push. Uh, you know, one of the things that Taft Hartley did uh, was allow states to pass so-called right to work laws um, that allow uh, people to opt out of unions to become leeches, uh, basically uh, sucking off the uh, work uh, and the commitment and the finances that other that the union members uh, uh, do um, and put into the union so that uh, they don't have to pay into it and it weakens unions. And and uh, th this has been, you know, this is an intentional act by employers to undermine the ability of this these independent organizations called unions to give us as workers power. That's the last thing that they want. And that's why this is agenda point number one for the Republican Party. Yeah, no, I mean, it's making sure that workers are exploitable and desperate. And which is why, you know, you look at what they're doing with unemployment, how they're you know trying to claw back a little bit of an extra benefit to help people through a tough time. Uh, it's about making people desperate and exploitable uh, because we need cheap labor, right? I mean, I always say, you know, cheap labor and exploitable uh, environmental regulations are like heroin to a CEO. They, they just can't get off the fix. Yeah, it's been really remarkable uh, to watch this over the last month or two and having low wage workers, people who are, were working for a Walmart or working for Uber or Lyft is it, or these various gig workers, you know, take the time during the pandemic. They have some benefits. They can breathe and they can make life decisions without having to worry, per se, about where the next paycheck's coming from, because the government is providing a safety net for once and then making a decision to say, you know what? I think I want something different in my life than this terrible, low-paying job. And to watch employers deal with this, with workers having even the tiny amount of power that gives them to simply say, yeah, I think I'm going to try to do some other kind of job. And to watch them freak out and try to drive workers into a state of desperation really is an excellent window into the ways in which the employer class looks at everyday workers, which is as cheap, expendable, meaningless labor. But in fact, they need us in order to make their money. 
And so now they're having to scramble and do things like, you know, give $500 bonuses if you agree to work at McDonald's or something like that, because now low wage workers have a, a, a sense of power. And so, you know, let's cut off their unemployment benefits and do everything else possible to drive them back into a state of desperation. It's, it's, it's a sad thing. And really, you know, th this is what, uh, this is what a lack of unions has, has led to. Yeah. You know, I, I go back to the, you know, the, you know, to Taft Hartley and one of the main uh, ideas was to prevent strikes, was to, to weaken unions ability uh, and, and, and to, to stop the strikes. Now, you're the guy who literally wrote the book on America's history in 10 strikes. Um, you know, you go back to those moments that you know, that people you know said, we're, we're going to exert the only power that working people really have. And that's the power to fold our arms and, and march in the streets. Um, once you take that away, you, you've taken their power away. So in that vein, Taft Hartley has done exactly what it was supposed to do, which is basically end uh, the right to strike uh, and ability the ability to demand better wages. Yeah, you know, on the left, Taft Hartley kind of gets demonized for kicking communists out of the labor movement, and that is part of what it did. Um, however, for everyday workers, you know, really a lot more important is the ways in which it limited worker action, communist or not. I mean, the vast majority of workers were not communist, and Taft Hartley seriously limited what they could do, right? That in the 1930s and in the post, in the immediate post-World War II period, you, the union movement and worker power was built by not just striking for you to be, you know, at your workplace when you had issues, but it were things like solidarity strikes, secondary boycotts, mass picketing, right? That these these kind wildcat strikes, right? That these the these other sorts of strikes that might be, you know, that your neighbor was going on strike. Um, and you worked in an affiliate industry, and so you were going to, and your union was going to go on strike too to support your neighbor, right? And this, this, this kind of solidarity strike, you know, these secondary strikes that would begin to take over an economy and move more toward what we call a general strike, that was a big part of the, both the 1930s labor movement and what happened in the huge 1946 strike wave that was the precursor to Taft-Hartley. And so, you know, and, and these that's when these major gains were made by the union movement establishing itself and starting to get real victories. And this is exactly what Taft-Hartley was intended to stop. The anti-communist side of it is a relatively small part of that law, stopping workers from doing the things that made the union movement successful in the previous 15 years. That's the big point of the no, law. No, absolutely. And, and, and that's been tremendously effective. No, you're absolutely right. And I... I... I'm fortunate enough that I'm old enough to rem to have met a lot of the people who fought those battles. My grandfather was, you know, actually fought the battles to to get the, the Teamsters National Master Freight Agreement up and running. Uh, where you know, in that contract, it says that you don't have to move struck goods. Uh, it, it's in that contract that you know they're not going to do that, even though Taft Hartley says that that's kind of that's illegal. You have to, you can't boycott, you can't, uh, you can't do that. To, to, you know, secondary strikes, all that stuff. Um, you know, the tales that they told of, you know, going on strike every couple of years uh, just to, to build that kind of solidarity and to build the kind of, uh, you know, the militancy that the working class had, um, that's been broken. And you, you, you can say it was Reagan forward, but I would argue it's probably even before Reagan that that was happening. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the labor room was already in decline before Reagan and, and certainly firing the air traffic controllers is this giant moment. But, you know, union density was falling since the mid 50s. And, you know, what Taft Hartley does in part is discourages mass organizing and it takes away some of the tools. And this is where the communists more come into play because they were very good organizers even if they were organizing for non-communist unions, right? And so you have these trained organizers who are radicals organizing regular workers for regular unions and, you know, taking them out of the, the labor movement really and, and making these other tactics illegal undermines the ability, the willingness, and the, really the payoff for mass organization. And this begins to impact the labor movement as early as the 1960s I mean, it remains a major player in American life, maybe until Reagan, but it's already in decline. And, and, and I think that the, the fact that the Taft-Hartley Act 
is passed over Harry Truman's veto says it all right the president vetoes this law and in the senate the senate the, the vote to override the veto is 68 to 25 right it's not even close that 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 even at this moment of tremendous labor power not just a majority of people in congress oppose the labor movement but a super majority right. opposes what the labor movement was doing and, and that's that's very sobering no, and they're on the side of corporate America, which the other thing that it did, um, you know, the original National Labor Relations Act uh, made employers be neutral. And we've just lived through Amazon spending two hundred million dollars uh, to, 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 quote unquote, convince their workers to be union free uh, as where the original National Labor Relations Act would have had them be neutral and make it up to the workers to decide. Now they can spend two hundred million dollars or you know unlimited money harassing, intimidating, doing all the things that we saw Amazon do and it'd be perfectly legal. Yeah, I mean, you you have now an entire world of very sophisticated anti-union consultants and, and law firms, um, sophisticated propaganda videos, intensive uh, employer campaigns, and you know it, it's almost. I mean, let's face it; it's almost impossible in the private sector, especially, to form a union these days. Um, and this is why I, I'm skeptical that you know that we can just start you know say organizing Amazon. Let's let let let's say because. You know, it, it makes sense on one level, but then once you look at just the, the tools that Amazon has, it, it really is almost impossible that the National Labor Relations Act has ta effectively taken over by corporations. The procedure to gain a union and then even if you win that election to get a first contract is tremendously difficult, almost impossible. It's very difficult to see how we are going to revitalize the American labor movement without labor law reform coming first. That at least part of Taft-Hartley has to be repealed in order to once again level the playing field so that if a workers want a union, that they actually can get that union without being afraid of losing their jobs and without having to have undergone these intensive, sophisticated, and, and quite scary propaganda campaigns. No, I mean, I go back to the, uh, for me, the, the simple message is just repeal Taft-Hartley and bring back the original intent of the NLRA, which was to give workers some bit of power. Because in the original law, uh, employers had no rights. Uh, none whatsoever, because they understood at that time that employers have all the rights. Uh, this just gave workers a little bit. Now, I did want to get your thoughts, because today the Supreme Court uh, came up with a decision that, again, as you've pointed out, with may, without you know, substantial labor law reform, without a legal system that recognizes uh, the rights of workers to join and form unions and the ability to do that, uh, the deck is really stacked. And now the Supreme Court... Uh, they have come out, and, and again, another anti-union decision here in this uh, this Cedar Point Nursery versus Assad case in California, where, where in California, labor organizers had access uh, to employer property to talk to workers about joining a union, where, you know, this is a carve-out for them, because that doesn't happen anywhere else, really. Uh, and now the Supreme Court's taken that away. Yeah, and, and this really scary part about that, you know, is is that, you know, if you just look at the decision itself, you might say, well, it's a relatively small issue, it's California only, right, and it, it goes back to the farm workers organizing, but the way the decision was written, it's actually very scary, because what it effectively does is say that that anything that unions or potentially any part of the regulatory state does, such as environmental protection, unconstitutionally takes, you know, basically takes rent or money uh, from corporations. And, and that is opening the door for something that really has the potential for the Supreme Court to effectively recreate the Lochner era where employers had all of the rights, right? The National Labor Relations Act gives workers rights. The previous Supreme Court era effectively gave employers rights and workers no rights. And that is really what the Supreme Court is moving back toward. And that more, maybe more than any other issue in the country, is true Republican orthodoxy. Donald Trump, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, 
anybody running in 2024, they all support this. And all six of those Republican Supreme Court justices support this, too. Um, and so the potential uh, for really decimating not only labor, but environmental protections and consumer protections is very, very real coming from this hard right Supreme Court. So the question that I keep coming back to, let's say something like the PRO Act does get passed. Uh, what what good is it going to be if you have a Supreme Court who's just going to toss it out? Uh, going back to the Lochner era where, you know, we use uh, liberty of contract or the new freedom of contract argument to say that we can we can have no infringements on the employer employee relationship. Well, I mean, you know, look, it, it, it's possible. I mean, the, the Supreme Court could throw such a law like that out. Now, that's a big step. Right. Because, you know, one thing that the Supreme Court discovered in the 1930s is that if you consistently throw out popular legislation, that there is a backlash to the court, that the that the uh, uh, that the res that respect for the court disappears. And that is what led President Roosevelt to talk about court packing again. And while, unfortunately, Democrats today, such as Joe Manchin are, and Dianne Feinstein and others, are sort of unwilling to recognize the reality of the present, um, the vast majority of Democrats, both in the House and in the Senate, are moving in this direction. And that, what that means is that if, the, if, if something like the PRO Act is able to be passed and other popular legislation to protect workers is passed and the court just consistently throws it out, there could be a serious backlash to the court here. Does John Roberts, does Sam Alito, does Neil Gorsuch or Brett Kavanaugh, do they care about this? Well, probably not. So it is possible that they will throw all of this out. But there is. But also, that's why we can talk about expanding to the Supreme Court as part of this, because it's an if it's an undemocratic institution and we're demanding to live in a democratic nation, the court has to be responsive to the public. You know, I look at this and again, I keep coming back to the sad reality of, of where we are in this moment. You know, we, you go back to the Carter era where there was the talk of repealing Taft-Hartley, the, you know, the filibuster during the Clinton year for strike replacement, the Obama time of, of uh, the Employee Free Choice Act. And now we're talking about the PRO Act and there's all of this talk of we got to do something, we got to do something. And yet time and time and time again, nothing gets done. The standard of living for the average working person is getting worse and worse. Uh, corporate America is robbing us blind at every turn. And we're we're becoming a much angrier society because it's my view. The, the reason the temperature is so hot right now is people are struggling. People are hurting. Uh, we aren't living the American dream that we were led to believe was possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess in terms of, of thinking about hope here a little bit, if, if that's possible, you know, I do think that the the. The reality is that for a long time, you know, the Democratic Party was really pretty bad on a lot of these issues through the Clinton era, definitely back to the Carter era and really through the Obama era. And now you're at a point where most Democratic politicians support things like the PRO Act. They, they supported the kind of safety net that was developed during the pandemic, right, that did so much to, as we talked about earlier, to give the low wage workers a sense of power. Um, and that we may be moving toward a recognition of the situation that we're in, a rejection, at least to the Democratic Party, of unlimited corporate power and at least some rights going back to workers. But how do we actually win that when you have, you know, an undemocratic system that Republicans are rigging and you still have some recalcitrant Democrats? It's no easy answer here. Right. But I think that if you don't, pass this kind of legislation if you don't work to level the playing field it is entirely likely that the rhetoric and the anger and the violence will keep rising because people don't have an outlet uh to find a sense of hope in american life again yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sadly right there with you. So, so last line of questioning I've got for you, because last night we had um, Randy Corrigan on from the, the Teamsters Union talking about, you know, their resolution that they'll vote on tomorrow uh, to, to organize Amazon. And look, every union in the country is going, we got to we got to organize Amazon and the Teamsters absolutely have to do something. Uh, because UPS is a target of Amazon. Uh, if Amazon takes over the, the, the small package industry, those good family sustaining, good wage jobs that that, uh, that they have at UPS are really in jeopardy. But given the, constant, the, the laws that we're living under, 
Uh, I don't see it possible. I, I'm curious. Do you do you see a, a way forward in in organizing Amazon given the situation that we're we're currently in? It's awful tough. I mean, you know, you saw the retail workers, you know, nationalize a campaign, actually get the president of the United States to endorse the campaign, which had never happened before. And it still doesn't really matter. So, you know, if the Teamsters were, say, to organize Amazon drivers, maybe there is a path there. I mean, the Teamsters have a lot more resources than the retail workers. They have a longer history. They can bring more to the table. So, you know, maybe it's possible there could be some limited victories there. But again, you know, what you have to do is to convince people who have not really been around unions a whole lot in their lives to listen to you, the union, and not listen to this corporate, you know, propaganda effort. And that's proven very difficult because we're used to hearing corporate propaganda. We're used to a society in which we identify with our employers. These days, we're not as used to a society where we band together as workers and form unions and take power back from the employer. And so the promise of the union, we've seen this in campaign after campaign, where the promise of the union can get a lot of voter, a lot of workers to say they're going to vote yes. But then after that intensive campaign, they end up voting no because they're scared, right. because they're misinformed, because they've been a victim of this propaganda effort. Do the Teamsters have some magic beans that will allow them to break through on that? Well, you know, I, I think you have to keep trying, and I, I certainly encourage the Teamsters to do so. Um, it's going to be tough. I mean, I think we're going to need to see it happen before a lot of us believe it can happen, but, but good luck to them. Yeah, no, we, we, we've got to build that build that culture of, of militancy, that culture of unionism, not just in, in the workplace, but uh, in society as a whole to help push in that direction. But, Eric, I appreciate the time. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Good stuff, Eric Loomis. Uh, uh, make sure you check out the blog, Lawyers, Guns, Money blog. Uh, we'll get links out on social media on how you can take a look at that. Also, get his book, uh, History of America in Ten Strikes. Uh, fantastic stuff. Let's take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. Saving work in America, one show at a time. The Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day the despised Taft-Hartley Act became law. It was a direct retaliatory response to the 1946 post-war strike wave where millions walked off the job after waiting years for basic demands. The labor movement mobilized against the slave labor bill through numerous rallies. The AFL joined the CIO in threatening 24-hour strikes across whole industries in protest as the bill wound its way through Congress. 11,000 soft coal miners in Pennsylvania walked out in a spontaneous protest strike earlier in the month. The bill passed over the veto of President Harry S. Truman, who would invoke it a dozen times over the course of his presidency. Many union leaders hailed Truman as a friend of labor for his 11th hour veto. Labor Party advocates were incensed that of the 219 congressional Democrats, 126 voted in favor of the bill. Practically overnight, the labor movement had been pushed back 25 years. Taft-Hartley was nothing short of disastrous for the American labor movement. With the stroke of a pen, the act criminalized many of the actions key to historic union victories in the 30s and 40s. Jurisdictional strikes, secondary boycotts, solidarity strikes, closed shops, and mass picketing were just a few of the most basic trade union activities now outlawed. The act helped fire the first shots of the McCarthy Red Scare by mandating that union officers file non-communist affidavits with the government, which was later found to be unconstitutional. The act also provided the ammunition needed to strangle strikes by empowering the president to easily acquire strike-breaking injunctions. And it allowed for the rapid growth of right-to-work laws at the state level. And because of Taft-Hartley, the union movement has suffered ever since. 
Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. Just to kind of bring this back around full circle. I mean, the fact is, 74 years ago today, uh, Taft Hartley went into into law, and and the power that it gave employers. I mean, you know, I often remind people that the uh, Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Law, which was written in 1915. Uh, still refers to the employer-employee relationship as master and servant. And ultimately, that's the goal in all of this. Uh, the goal is to return to that kind of of master-servant relationship. And, and look, as someone who has been fortunate throughout my work life, to never have been in that, in that position, that knowing that I can only be fired from my job if I did something wrong, and that once I went through a due process process, a grievance procedure, and did, you know had the opportunity to defend myself, um, then I would either lose my job or suspensions or whatever. But there was due process. You had the opportunity to defend yourself. They don't want that. They want absolute rule. They want both hands firmly on the steering wheel and completely in control. And sadly, you know, I talked to you know so many people who are who are in this weird kind of mindset. In fact, you know, when I, I see an Amazon driver and there's a chance for me to, you know, to talk to them, uh, I do. You know, I've, I've done it a couple of times where I'll go, hey, you know, you know, you know, I'll ask questions. You know, what do you make? What do you make doing this? How do you get this job? You know, I want to know. And I'll say, you know, the guy over in that, that brown truck over there, they make like 30 bucks an hour, like 35 bucks an hour. What are you making? Um, that's what you should be doing. Uh, what what what's happening is they're using you to tear conditions down, and I go, you want to you want to make that here? Here's a union card. Uh, you know, start start thinking about joining and forming a union here to raise your conditions, to to raise your wages. And I had one guy look at me. He goes, oh, I don't think my boss would like that. And that stopped me. It really stopped me dead in my tracks. Of what? Yeah, of course, he's not going to like it. Because that what what joining and forming a union means is more for the working person, a better share for the work, uh, for the for the labor that they produce. Better for the worker, better wages, better health care, better retirement, better conditions, safer working conditions. Of course, the the boss isn't going to be happy, because now they have to a- actually deal with you. Not in, in a master-servant type relationship, but somewhere in the realm of, not equals, but at least somewhere in the arena where you have some ability to answer and ask questions. And, you know, when I tell people about at-will employment, I say, you know, Trader Joe's right now is the perfect example. We're in the midst of a pandemic. And now every everyone tells me, my employer says, there's an open door policy here. I can come talk to them about anything. Well, this kid at Trader Joe's, him and his buddy, said, hey, we don't think you're doing enough for us. We don't think you're doing enough to protect us. Wrote them a letter and said, hey, this is how you should be protecting us. What do you think they got back? Do you think they got a letter going, you know, you're right. We're going to do that. Thanks for the suggestion. You're a really good employee. We, we're so happy you're here. We're so happy you care about your coworkers. Do you think that's the letter they got? Hell No. They got a letter saying, you're fired. You're an at-will employee, and you have no rights to the job, and you're not Trader Joe material. But what happened to Open Door? What happened to the suggestion box? What happened to, oh, you care? Truth is, they don't, and you know that. We know that to our core. And Taft-Hartley is the, the bludgeon that they've been able to use. The fact that they limit their intent from the beginning was to limit strikes. Mission accomplished. No more jurisdictional strikes. No more wildcat strikes. No more solidarity strikes. None of that. No secondary boycotts. No mass picketing. None of that. Illegal. And people who are doing well, people are going. You know what? I, I, I've got a house payment. I, you know, I'm on the treadmill. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in debt to the company store. The difference is there are multiple companies. You know, I got to keep paying the bills. Got to keep the kids fed. All that. I can't go on strike. They know that. And if they can threaten you with, hey, if you go on strike, you may not come back. We might replace you, especially if it's an economic strike. They know they can scare people because they do it so well. 
And then they threw in that that nonsensical right to work nonsense. You have the right to work without any rights and without any work. Uh, but what what they really mean is we have the right to fire you anytime we want. And and oh by the way, <laughs> oh, uh, we, we have the right to not be forced to negotiate into a a closed shop agreement. Now this is what I love. I love my anti government people. Who said, get government out of our lives. But in this instance, no, no. We want the government to say what an employer and an employee can agree on. Yeah, that's confusing as hell to me. But it's where we are because it says in law, the group of employees, the union, cannot agree with the company, even if they want to, even if they agree, even if one gives up something and they negotiate it, they cannot agree that everyone in the place is a member of the union. It's illegal. It's against the law. Thanks to Taft and Hartley. And why do they do this? Divide and conquer. If they can keep those divisions, and back where I started the program off today, those divisions that they create to keep people pitted against each other so that you're not looking at them, so that we're worried about, oh, that guy got a different work assignment, or that guy got a nickel more, or that guy you know, got to go home early, instead of going, hey, the boss is robbing us, and I'll tell you how it's happening. I go back to when I first started working in the LTL trucking industry. LTL industry was 85% unionized when I started. Starting weight rate was 14 bucks an hour, went up to 18 and some change back in the late 80s, early 90s. Today, the starting rate is 18 bucks an hour, top rate of 25, almost 26. Not a real huge jump over 30 plus years, is it? You go back, you do that economic wizardry calculator that says, you know, in this year, you know, this is how much dollars today would be worth. You know, back when I started, it was like making 32 bucks an hour today to start there. That's because the union had power to say, you know what, we demand better wages, hours, conditions. And as that power has diminished, the wages have come down. Now, in the union environment, wages are still higher than they are in the non-union, but not as much as they were. And that comes down to the power that we lost because of Taft-Hartley, because of all of these Republican, mostly Republican, and Southern Democrats who are now solidly Republican. These corporatists who say, no, no, we, we can't give those working people too much power. No, no, we can't do that. They might, well, demand better wages, hours, and conditions. They may feel some sense of empowerment. They may run for elections. They may vote. Can't have that. They may want better schools. They want, may want health care. They may want what want. Because after all, Samuel Gomper said, what does labor want? More. More schools and less prison. More libraries and less vice. More of the better things that cultivate life. But we can't talk about that anymore. Because corporate America wouldn't be happy. The boss wouldn't like that. Which is why, again, I go back to something that my grandfather said. If a rich guy is going to take a buck out of his pocket to tell me I don't need something, you better spend two to get it. We better start spending. Not just our money, but our physical capital. We better get on the same page. I'd love to hear your thoughts. How is it where you work? Is it a master-servant type relationship? Do they really care about the suggestion box? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. Waving the flag of freedom for people, not corporations. Rick Smith. More than a dozen people were killed, including 10 children. First storm of the 2021 hurricane season makes deadly landfall in the United States. New study confirms the U.S. Southwest is much drier than just decades ago. The amount of heat trapped by the planet has roughly doubled since 2005. Plus, a fee on electric vehicles 
privatization of infrastructure. Those are proposals that I would not support. Senator Bernie Sanders draws bright red line against endless infrastructure talks. All of that redlining and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. California is running out of water. And this time, just when we started showering again. (laughs) Wait, we're showering again? This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, it's pretty early in the year, but here we go again. Yes, as we go to air, Tropical Storm Claudette hit Gulf Coast states over the weekend, the first named storm to make landfall in the U.S. in the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season. Its torrential rains caused flash flooding that killed at least 14 people in Alabama, including nine children who died in a 17-vehicle pileup. The tragedy highlights concerns that the official scale categorizing storms covers only wind speeds and doesn't communicate flood risk Mm -hmm. to the public. That's been a problem now for several seasons in a row, and this was just a tropical storm. So, you know, people don't freak out about that, but there is a lot of rain, a lot of danger. It's the opposite problem out in the U.S. West. Wildfires erupted and spread in the West after what turned out to be the hottest week in history for some regions last week. Wildfire risk in the West is intensifying due in part to an emerging mega drought plaguing much of the western United States. In a new UCLA study, researchers found the Southwest's hottest, driest days are much drier today than they were just a few decades ago. Literally, humidity on dry days during the summer has declined in the U.S. Southwest since the 1950s. And not surprisingly, the greatest decreases in humidity occur at the same time as the hottest temperatures. Mm. The decline is worse in California and Nevada, where humidity has dropped by one-third on the driest days. A different joint study by both NASA and NOAA finds that the Earth's atmosphere is now trapping an unprecedented amount of heat. Using satellite data, researchers measured what is known as the Earth's energy imbalance, the difference between how much energy the planet absorbs from the sun compared to how much it radiates back out into space. They calculate that the amount of heat trapped by the planet's atmosphere has roughly doubled since 2005 due to increases in greenhouse gas emissions, which is contributing to more rapidly warming oceans, air, and land. You are nothing but good news today. And it's just a reminder that climate scientists project that today's record summer temperatures will be tomorrow's average summer temperatures in coming decades. If only we had listened to yesterday's climate scientists about, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 years ago. Another new study underscores that ditching fossil fuels will also save millions of lives from toxic air pollution. Pollution from cars and industry and even cook stoves creates tiny particles that can lodge in the heart and lungs. An international team of researchers examined comprehensive health data from more than 200 countries, calculating that in 2017, more than a million people died worldwide due to the burning of fossil fuels. Half of those deaths were caused by coal pollution. Mm. As negotiations over an infrastructure package drag on among several different groups of bipartisan congresspeople, Senate Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders on Meet the Press on Sunday criticized Republican proposals to fund infrastructure repairs by raising the gasoline tax and imposing new fees on electric vehicles. Calling such measures a hidden tax on working Americans, Sanders cited recent investigative reports showing that billionaires and corporations frequently pay nearly nothing in federal taxes. If it is regressive taxation, gotcha. you know, raising the gas tax or a fee on electric vehicles or the privatization of infrastructure. No, I wouldn't support it. You don't tax people using electric cars. You don't tax things that are good. You tax things that are bad. Finally, some good news for the U.S. Virgin Islands. The troubled, polluting Lime Tree Bay refinery in St. Croix has announced it will permanently close due to multiple class action lawsuits and high debt. The Biden EPA temporarily shut down the refinery last month as a, quote, imminent threat to people's health after multiple accidents in which the plant rained oil droplets on surrounding communities and contaminated water supplies and released noxious gases that sent residents to hospitals. The controversial refinery had hastily been reopened by the Trump administration last year. While residents welcome the plant's closure this week, they question how the region will recover from the harm the plant has already caused. Oil raining down on the people. Yep. 
Glad they closed it. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Find, follow, and share us planet-wide on the Facebooks and the Twitters at Green News Report. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. And this has been your Green News Report. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the breaking news, evidently uh, there has been a bipartisan agreement on infrastructure. Roughly $1.2 trillion, they're saying. Uh, That will be $1.2 trillion over eight years or $974 billion over five uh, they are saying $559 billion in new spending, and they're saying that it's paid for. Now, for me, haven't seen the details. Uh, is this going to be raising taxes on the very wealthy, or are we talking higher gas tax, user fees, that kind of stuff, which you know are coming? Because, hey, hey, we can't tax the rich. We need them. If we could just get them a little wealthier, then maybe it'll st- maybe their pockets will fill up and spill out. But according to this report over at Axios, there is a bipartisan agreement. Uh, what they didn't put in the story is who the 10 Republicans are. I don't care about the agreement. I want to know who the 10 who are going to vote for it are. Anyway, here to share some thoughts on maybe the bipartisan agreement. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's coming. I've asked our good friend, former Ohio congressman and political analyst Bob Nay to come talk with us. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Well, thank you, Rick. So uh, you buy in the bipartisan agreement? You think there's? You think there are ten Republicans who are going to sign on to this? I'm going to go with it's potentially seventy five percent there, twenty five percent possibility it completely blows apart. If it is going to be put together, it has to be by July the fourth ish. Okay or the whole time frames and for the fall and next year's elections won't fit. So that, that's a couple of things off the bat. If I have to guess some names, uh, two that I would throw out there, one would be Portman of Ohio. He's not going to run again. Right. Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Um, those are Those are two... You know, of the ten, I, I believe those are two of the. 10. And of course, you're going to get Murkowski, Cassidy, and well, Romney. Yeah. So there are right. five. I want to right. know who the other five are. Right. And I don't know today. I I called up on the hill and talked to everybody I could, and I think that if they if they knew, they would have told me. Right. It's uh, talk about you know usually uh, nothing secret up on the hill, but uh, so far it's I think too that they are uh, keeping it down low because if it gets out, look the. The Republicans' big deal about this, as you know, is uh, is how they pay, because that's not spelled out. No one knows. The Republicans have already nixed tax increases. So when when we know that, obviously, some of the 10 may be, obvi- <laughs> if they want to fund it, have to be paying for it somehow. So maybe they don't want the heat of being recognized. Maybe this comes together fast, and then it moves before, you know, a lot of heat's generated, because once... They get uh, the information out there, Rick, about what's in it, and more people, you know, I think will be comfortable with it right. no matter how, you know, the, the taxes are increased. Now, the, the reason I put the 25% out there, it could blow up, I, I'm curious whether the progressive uh, Democratic side will be so uncomfortable with this infrastructure because it's not going to include some priorities, uh, will it kind of spill over into warfare or will they say wait a minute we have to have uh, we have to have the bill you know clearly the president wants a deal he you know he wants a deal and, and he wants a deal he wants something to be accomplished for the democratic side going into 2022 certainly no it's something that has sure. to happen and look the democrats That's- should come along but there there's got to be there's got to be a line in the sand and this is where you know i've i've seen some rumblings of you know you know, how are you going to pay for it? You said they're not going to raise taxes. Well, of course they're going to raise taxes on somebody. It's just not going to be the wealthy. And you could call fees something else or, or a gas tax, not right. really a tax. Right. But ultimately, you, if you're paying for it, you're paying for it through a tax mechanism where someone's paying for it. And is it going to be the folks at the bottom or is it going to be the folks at the top? Right. Right. To be seen yet. So, yeah. I mean, they've, they've got... 
they've got something that's, like I said, my opinion is 75% decently solid, or they wouldn't be taking, you know, it public this much if they didn't have you know, something in the works. No, I, I hope we get something because we need it. And then, you know, cause, uh, let me ask you this, because you're, you're one of the best strategists I know. Uh, you take this, you get what you can, you move this forward, and then if you have to go budget reconciliation on all of the other priority stuff, uh-huh. is that the plan, or, or do you live and die on this hill? No, I don't think that the Democratic side can afford to have this as the measure. There has to be police reform. Uh, that that has to happen. In fact, I mean, I, I would probably be, you know, spat at by some people for saying this, but the, the police reform has to happen right now before, even before the, uh, the election uh, reform, because it looks like police reform can move when right now election reform is stuck until they come up with something. I'm not saying it's done, but it's stuck. But I just don't think they can afford to have just, you know, here's the infrastructure bill. But again, they can't afford to, to not have a major bill. Right. That's that's the other part of it. So now, you say you know, tie the, the police reform into the infrastructure bill? No, I, I'm just saying that you have to have the infrastructure bill. The police reform is a possibility after this. And then you've got reconciliation. You know, reconciliation, do you do you throw an election reform bill in there? Is that economic? Can, can you do, they do have, that? Well, it could be because uh, when we did the Help America Vote Act, uh, it was economic because we supplied the monies out to the boards of elections. Uh, there's a cost factor to it if you're going to have it. Yeah, now, again, the problem with factor. that is you got Manchin who said he, it's got to be bipartisan. Well, yeah, I understand that, but... You know, when you get reconciliation, uh, Manchin would have a tough, tough decision to make. Very, very tough. And also, possibly with reconciliation, because of everything else that is thrown into the, you know, with the kitchen sink, you might get a couple of Republicans that would go with it and say, well, I don't like the election reform, but, you know, all these other issues were in there. You never know. Yeah. It'd be interesting they to see just, how they this... just need to cut a deal yep. with one Republican if they don't have Senator Manchin. No, we, we, we absolutely well, need two, to get something done. Two Republicans, done. not one, but yeah. you don't want to be just have one. You, you want two. You know, especially on the infrastructure front. I don't know if you saw the story coming out of D.C. Uh, where the pedestrian bridge collapsed on a semi. Yes, I saw that today. Uh, and, I mean, that. Uh, it's, fortunately, no one was killed. Amazingly, no one was killed. Five people was, were, went to the hospital, but this this pedestrian bridge over the over the the highway there just collapsed right down, and it just smashed this truck to bits. Uh, and, and we don't need an infrastructure plan. The, the walk, the pedestrian walkways are collapsing. Well, it was yeah, and in fact, I mean, it was a terrible you know thing that happened, but uh, obviously, you know, the, the timing of it kind of shows what's you know going on. Um, I mean, there are structurally deficient bridges, and I'm not just a little bit of them. By the way, Pennsylvania is second yep. uh, on the list with, I can't remember the exact figures, I'm having a senior moment, 3,000 some, okay, bridges are failing in Pennsylvania. 3,000. No, I know. <laughs> Uh, and, and the number of bridges that have weight restrictions are through the roof. Uh, you know, we've got miles, you know, thousands of miles that need to be repaved because we've we've neglected this stuff. I mean, ask any truck driver. Pennsylvania has the worst roads in the country, uh, you know, or one of the states that have the worst roads in the country because we just we haven't done it. Right. Right. But I fortunately, mean, nothing just... collapsing today. So I'm I'm happy yep. on that front. Uh, knock, knock on something to do that. Uh, let's move on to something else. Uh, you know, talking of economics, uh, Janet Yellen came out and said, uh, basically warned that if we didn't raise the debt ceiling uh, here by uh, July 31st, um, c- catastrophic consequences. Uh, why are we still talking about the debt ceiling? You know, during a pan, at the end of a pandemic, when the economy's struggling, they're talking about mass inflation. They're talking about all these things that, that right. could be chaotic. And now, oh, hey, let's have let's have economic Armageddon thrown on top of it. Right. She had warned. I think she her words were, "It's absolutely catastrophic." You know, if it if it doesn't happen, and of course she, you know, 
is urging them by July 31st, the deadline to pay uh, a portion of the of the Fed 28 trillion in debt uh, in that we are. To, and, and of course, you've got to extend the debt ceiling. I used to call this the yawn vote um, when Bush was president. It was the yawn vote. Uh, you had a debt ceiling. Somebody stood up and complained about it. Somebody else said something else, and you yawned. You stuck your voting card in the machine. You pushed yes, and you went to dinner. Right. That was the yawn vote. When Obama became president, it became the end of the world vote. It, <laughs> it was went the from the yawn down. vote to the end of the world vote every single time. And how about when Trump became president? You know, where was the you know? End Did of we the world? have a debt? ceiling increase? I don't even remember the vote on it. Well, I think they wrapped it up in reconciliation. Wow. I think. Now that, I now that I'm thinking about it, you're, you're right. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear about the debt ceiling at all during the Trump years. You heard nothing. And he was spending like a drunken sailor, so he had to bump up it against it. Right. It, it could not have just all of a sudden vanished. Uh, it couldn't. Yeah, for eight years, it was the you know the the Armageddon. We were always looking over the abyss. You know what happens if if Congress doesn't uh, pay their bills? What happens to the global economy? Uh, you know, it, and and here we are. You know, a Democrat in the White. I think that's right. the key: a Democrat in the White House, no potential of not not paying our bills. Right. I know. Back in two thousand nineteen, uh, I, I I carried a story. At that time, we we might have talked about it back then. But I carried a story at that time about uh, Trump, the White House, you know, begging uh, the top Republicans to move quick, raise the debt ceiling. And it became very urgent because, you know, Capitol Hill was having some problems talking about issues. And then there was a, a stock market glitch at the time. And uh, the chief of staff was uh, Mulvaney at that time. And he said, you know, we have to have this done. And I'm, I'm going to look it up, and I, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think it just went somewhere, you yeah. know, in reconciliation or, or, you know, or the continuing resolution on the – because they had to have done something, and Trump publicly – wanted that debt ceiling raised. He needed it, absolutely, because you can't spend like a drunken sailor without some room on your credit card. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah, so I'm going to look it up, too, now, because you, 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 now, now it's, it's popped into my head. Uh, last story I wanted to get to real quick before we wrap up. Uh, Supreme Court, I agreed with the Supreme Court decision today. I agreed that the school here in Pennsylvania overstepped its bounds in punishing this cheerleader for using the F word on Snapchat. Uh, it's not the school's responsibility. It was her parents' responsibility to wash her mouth out with soap or take her account away or something, <laughs> but not the school's responsibility. Right. And it, it was off-site, too. She wasn't in school when she did it. And so, it was. look, it was 8-1, uh, to one, wasn't it? Yeah, I it was 8-1. to one. An 8 to 1 ruling, and it said, okay, students have a right to you know free speech, and that is more important than the school's interest in preventing disruptive speech, and I think they also made some statement about, you know, where it happened, when it happened, uh, and, you know, it wasn't during uh, school time, but they were saying public schools um, might want to regulate some of the off-campus student speeches and interests of, of what they have, but uh, it's not a big enough concern uh, that, uh, and it, it bridges the free speech so schools shouldn't be able to take it that far while the kids are off campus. Right. Unless no. it has some bearing, I think they said, directly on something that happened. No, I, I absolutely agree. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I agree with the decisions. It wasn't the school's responsibility to do. It was the parents' responsibility. And this is one where I brought this up, uh, and I talked about this when, the, when it happened. I'm going, mm -hmm. what exactly are the parents doing taking this to the Supreme Court? Your kid's a foul mouth, uh, and you're, you're in, encouraging this. If I would have done that, my mother would have not only washed my, made me eat soap, she'd have beat the living tar out of me. Right. What is exactly. it about our society that goes, no, no, my 15-year-old daughter can use the F word anytime she wants. I'm confused. I know, I'm just old. That's what it is. No, I'm I'm older, and I'm with you, because I've, I've actually had friends of mine who, I, I you know, and some younger friends who have just very casually use it in front of, you know, older people, 80, 85 year old people. And I'm like, you know, give me a break. Yeah, you know, no. Don't do that. If you I, can't control it, 
you know, off and on when you're in private, you do it with yep. your friends. But when if you can't control it, then you need to stop it. Yep. No, I, I, I say I, I never swore once in front of my grandmother. I said right. Jesus once in the wrong tone, and she split my lip. <laughs> never anything right. harsher than that. It was just the wrong tone. Right. Exactly. Uh, I can't imagine if I would have gone on an f bomb laden rant, what kind of abuse I would have gotten. Mm -hmm. exactly. But I wouldn't have done it because and, I because I respect her. And deserved, gotten and, and deserved, and deserved. <laughs> and that's that's my problem with this whole thing. The Supreme sure. Court shouldn't have had to, to decide this. The right. school shouldn't have been involved. It should have been the parent going, "No, no, I got this." That's what should have happened. Sure, absolutely. Because that's what happened with my kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but there you go. The, the Supreme Court decided something we agree on. <laughs> there you go. Uh, eight to eight to one. There yeah. you go. Uh, I, I got to look up who the one was because now I got to know who was. <laughs> yeah. Watch it be Thomas. Make some guesses, but <laughs> Clarence Thomas. Yeah, watch it be him, the guy who never. Oh uh, yeah, we won't go there. Okay. <laughs> uh, there you go, Bob. I appreciate okay. the time, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. No, no, seriously. I mean, you know, it. it this makes. It makes no sense that we live in this society where, look, when I was a kid, I used all the, the colory, salty language like everyone did. But you didn't do it around adults. You didn't do it around your parents. And you certainly didn't put it out for everyone to know you did it. Because I'll tell you, I had to come home and I, I'd have gotten a beating. You know, my mother was the one thing she was. Uh, she was willing to take to the belt uh, and the extension cord and the, the chair and the, all the other things I got hit with. And I turned out okay. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, anyway, if you missed any of today's program, the ricksmithshow.com. That's where you go to get the podcast, the Rick Smith Show app on the smartphone. Take the program on the go wherever you go. And as always, you can email me, rick, at the ricksmithshow.com. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at Show.com. Until next time. <laughs>